Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back with you with another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you here in my virtual math classroom. Today's focus is going to be on proportions, mostly solving them, trying to come up with a solution to a proportion based on what's missing. I'll apply some real life context, mostly it'll just be in the um, just math realm, just solving it, just having, having it set up already and then getting it through there. But let me uh, present to you just what I'm gonna be looking at here. There's a nice big heaping of information. Uh, I have a learning target for us, solving an algebraic proportion through different means, even with real life context, that's something that I wouldn't mind doing. Um, and there is a highlight problem down here that I'm going to be using as an example, not the one that I'm gonna be starting with, but an idea of what we're looking at and how it can be applied in different forms of questions. Now the success criteria, in order to make this a possible thing, we're going to be able to do this by eliminating fractions. Uh, if you don't know what a proportion is, I'll be getting into that in a little bit with those target words that you see, but a proportion involves fractions. Um, so eliminating fractions from both sides of the equation, using the least common multiple, again, another target word here, um, we're gonna be using the multiplication property of equality to do that, and this will assist us in solving said equation. Uh, the target words that we're going to be looking at here today, I'm really going to be focusing on kind of these two here, and then I will be referring to cross multiply a little bit. Once you understand, and I asterisked it for a reason, uh, I just want to let you know this right now. Cross multiplication is by and large a magic trick for math. It is something that we have learned to accept to use because it always works, but there is a reason behind it. They gave it a phrase. Math teachers don't really like to use it anymore. I generally don't, but to save time, I'm going to be giving the understanding of it. So long as you make sense of how it works, we can use it. And you don't want to misuse it in any other sort of way. So we'll be using cross multiplication. It's not a true target word, but it's something that I'm using so much that I'm calling it one. So it kind of just comes to fruition. So just keep that in mind when we're doing these. So cross multiplication or cross multiply, again, is going to be one of the target words, and that's used by using least common multiples. Okay, um, let's just look at the highlight problem here. Then I'm going to break down what all these words mean. Um, you'll get several examples in actually what they mean. I want to give some real life context, some uh, popular um, media uh, context with it as well. We'll make that happen. So here's the highlight problem. You have a totem pole right here. It's going to be 90 feet tall, whatever, you know, it doesn't really look 90 feet tall, but whatever. A big 90 foot tall totem pole that casts, totem pole that casts a shadow, like by the sun. Um, the shadow is 45 feet long. So 90 foot tall pole, 45, has a 45 foot long shadow. Uh, now there's a man that's standing sort of near that um, totem pole somewhere at the same time. And same time is important for this talk as well. The man's six feet tall, and he has a certain shadow length that we want to try and figure out. You might already know the answer to it as well. That'd be very uh, noble of you to be figuring out what it is. And when you are, you are actually using proportions to make it happen. We are going to determine the length of the man's shadow in feet. Now that'll be one in the end that we're going to do. We're going to do it actually using proportions. Uh, in the math realm, because I want you to be able to set up a proportion and then be able to solve it using the means that uh, you see fit. So in order to do this, let's go ahead and break down these target words. Let's make sure that we do understand what they do mean. Uh, a ratio. Ratio is kind of another simple way of saying, for us, mathematically, it's another simple way of saying fraction. Uh, a ratio is going to be a fraction. It's how you compare the quantitative values and scales and sizes of two things that can be measured. Sometimes. Sometimes they're not necessarily measured as much as they are qualified or ranked. But a ratio, for example, um, well, I'll, I'll just use a fraction. I'll just write the idea like A over B. A over B is a ratio comparing A's value or rank or qualification to B in some form. They don't have to be the same units. They don't have to, uh, they, they generally aren't the same size. That's the whole point of this thing. Um, an example in like a classroom is you can say something like um, the the ratio of boys and girls to, uh, um, I, I think that's how you say it, the ratio of boys to girls in a class is two to one. By that it means for every two boys there is one girl in a class. That doesn't mean there are only two boys in the class and one girl, it just means that for every two boys there's one girl. There could be 20 boys and 10 girls and that's the ratio that's at play. Um, so that's like an example. It's a comparison 
of two items and you can write it as a fraction. So that's what a ratio is again, a comparison of two items in a, for us normally in a quantitative way. Now a proportion, a proportion is a comparison of two ratios, an equal comparison, if you will. So for example, if I have a ratio right here that's A over B, and if I have another ratio, let's call it C over D, I can write out a proportion comparing A over B to C over D if they are indeed equal to one another. A proportion is an equation that uses ratios on both sides. So when I mentioned we got to eliminate fractions in an equation from both sides of an equation, here's an example. You have fraction on one side, you have a fraction on the other side, and we got to clear these out to help us solve the equation. I think normally that's just the best way to go about it. Specifically, and you'll see this, when your variable that like x, when we're solving for it, when it's in the denominator. We've seen x when it's in the numerator and we can probably do something down that you might know what to do. But when x is in the denominator, it makes it kind of a little more difficult to, to play with. And we're going to be doing it by using what's called a least common multiple. Now, least common multiple, I'm just going to break it down word by word here. And I'll give you two slide examples and then I'll be done with it. Least meaning smallest. Common meaning same. Multiple meaning multiplier. What is the smallest same multiplier uh, that, that you can use given, say, two numbers? For example, the least common multiple of the numbers 2 and 3, the least common multiple of the numbers 2 and 3 is the smallest number that is a multiple of both of these things. 2's multiples are like 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 3's multiples are like 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. They both share 6. And 6 is the smallest common multiple of both of them. So the least common multiple of 2 and 3 is 6. That's an example of a least common multiple. You've used it when trying to find a common denominator um, in, in fractions before. And we would kind of ideally do the same thing here. That's an idea of least common multiple. Cross multiply, like I said, kind of a magic step. I'll get into it when we do it, but it's kind of a way of visually doing something with this proportion without having to say least common multiple or without having to overthink too much about what it is. But you can't do it unless you know what it is. All right, I wanna hit that home. Now we are gonna do the highlight problem in a bit, but prior to that, I wanna give you examples of things with ratios uh, in real world context or things that might make sense to you where you think you might've seen it before and same with proportions and all that. Now the one I wanna do with ratios is given uh, with like televisions. Normally, or like when you grew up, you've only probably seen the 16 by nine aspect ratio form of a television, which is your general widescreen television. The computer monitor um, that you normally look at or your laptop screen also has, like in, a, like in a MacBook, also has a 16 by 9. I don't think your phone screen is, but your laptop screens generally would be. The 4 by 3 is those old tubes, and I don't want to say like old, old. Uh, it's not that long ago that this was in most households, but the fatter TV screens, um, the, the big television boxes, if you watch Friends, like on Netflix or whatever if Friends is on, you see those black bars on the side because Friends was shot in 4x3 uh, aspect ratio as well. So the 16x9 and 4x3, I shouldn't say by as in multiplication. Well, I could because it's like a area. But what we're doing there, you saw them as colons. So when you saw like 16 to 9 like that, that colon could also be represented with a fraction like that as well. And what that is saying is that for every 16 units we go wide, there are nine units that we go tall. That means if there was a television that was 16 inches wide, it would be nine, the widescreen TV, it would be nine inches tall. Or if it was 160 inches wide, it would be 90 inches tall. What I'm using right now is actually an example of proportions. Um, two things that have the share the same ratio, even though they might have different sizes, they compare in the same way 16 to 9. Or 4 to 3, for every 4 inches wide, you go 3 inches tall or something like that. This is a lot squarer. 4 is a lot closer to 3 when it comes to a uh, um, uh, multiple of 1 or the percentage growth as opposed to 16 to 9 for that. So that's one example of, say, a ratio. Now, there are a lot of different things when it comes to proportions, and uh, one that comes to mind for me, you know, that I really like to think of uh, from one of my favorite comedies of all time from the movie Dumb and Dumber. Um, if you've ever seen Dumb and Dumber, let me pull up the poster 
image. There we go. Dumb and Dumber, Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels, 1994. Uh, this this dates us 25 years ago. Uh, Dumb and Dumber, this this great buddy movie where they're on a road trip, and uh, you know one of the uh, lines in it 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 feels like a throwaway line when you actually watch the movie because it's in transition of other things that happen in the scene. But Jeff Daniels uh, is looking at a map, at just a road map. And he ends up saying, uh, his character is named uh, Harry, and he says to Lloyd, Jim Carrey's character, he says, you know, according to the map, we've only traveled about six inches. Now, the, the obvious, look, I don't, think it, I don't think I need to explain the joke, but just to talk about this again, the idea of the joke, again, he's so silly stupid that he's only referring to his map's distance that's traveled on there. A map is a lot smaller than wherever you're traveling. So he's looking at the map and he's saying, okay, I've, we've gone six inches on the map, so that's how far we've actually driven. When really they could have driven hundreds of miles, right? Six inches might be equivalent to something else. And to give that example, you know, let's go and look at like a California map. I'm going to pull this one up. So um, I don't really know what this is talking, uh, wind speed. But if you look at the very bottom right there, you can see where it shows a gauge of what 200 miles is equivalent to in California and what 300 kilometers is. I'm going to stick to the 200 miles because, you know, we're in the United States for that. Um, but let's say that that 200 miles bar was actually on it. Like, let's say you're looking at this map. And let's say that 200 miles represented actually six inches, just like the same thing. Let's say he's looking at this map. Harry's looking at this map and says, you know, according to the map, we've only traveled about six inches. But really, six inches is 200 miles. So if six inches is really 200 miles, that's another ratio that we're looking at there. Every 200 miles is six inches. Let me write an example of that ratio right here. Um, 200 miles for every six inches, 200 miles in real for every six inches on the map. That's an example of a ratio, comparing two items in some sort of way that can create a scale for us, that can create a scale for us. So going back to that map again, you know, what if you wanted to figure out the distance from San Francisco to San Diego and you could put um, 12 inches between those two if you could put 12 inches between those two, and if six inches is 200 miles, then 12 inches is how much, right? You can, you can come up with a linear proportion idea, and you've used proportions before, maybe on road trips or with how much gas you have left and how much you've driven. You can use proportions in a lot of different ways. By the way, that answer is 400 miles. You can say if six inches is 200 miles, then let's double that, 12 inches is 400 miles. That's a proportion. That's a proportion. So you've used it in a lot of different contexts before. Here's, um, uh, I, have, I have two more examples for you. Here's another example. Um, if you wonder how, if you wonder why your favorite show was ever canceled or why it was renewed, generally that's a matter of TV ratings, how many people are watching it. Um, and the company that deals with the measurements of TV ratings, their name is Nielsen. And Nielsen, what they do is, do they monitor every person's screen? When I watch f a football game, do they know that I'm watching it? The actual answer is no, they don't. What they do is, because they can only measure so many things, they can't hack into our TVs. Eventually, someday, maybe they'll have that capability. But they can't really get into our TV boxes and say, they're watching this particular thing right now. But they do have their own devices, and there are only so many, that they deliver to only so many households. And those households make up the rest of the U.S. TV-watching household population. Now, here are these are actual numbers. There are about 120 million households that have TVs in the United States. Okay, about 120 million households. And they, and they measure everything by households, not by people, but by households. Nielsen only uses about 40,000 40, households to gather their data. 40,000 out of 120 million, that's a ratio, by the way, 40,000 out of 120 million households, that is about... 0.03%. Nielsen only uses about 0.03% of households to extrapolate information for everybody else. For example, and this and this and this won't really work out perfectly. There's another example of a proportion. 
let's say of those 40,000 households, which by the way, they, they diversify those people very well. They do surveys with them, figure out who watches what, what the age demographics are, racial, uh, geographical breakdown, all these different things. They do a lot of determinations to figure these things out and they wanna make it as diverse as possible and say, this is as random as we can get with things and with 40,000 people. It's not like they just have everyone on the West Coast and you know that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but okay, so for example, 40,000 households. Let's say that 20,000 of those households are watching the Super Bowl. What they basically do is, look, 20,000 out of 40,000, that's half of them, that's 50%. What they do is they extrapolate that information and they say, okay, if 20,000 of those 40,000 households, if half of them, if half of them are watching the Super Bowl, then half of the United States is watching the Super Bowl. That's what they do. They extrapolate that. They use a proportionality thing. It might be a little more um, complex than just straight up proportion, but it's that idea. They grow it and say, if half of these guys are watching it, then half of these guys are. And half of 120 million is 60 million. 60 million people watching the Super Bowl I don't think is a real number because my example was bad. But that's what we mean by that when we talk about it. Um, uh, this kind of points to uh, another thing. There's a Family Guy episode that kind of tackles the whole Nielsen rating thing. There was one where the Griffins became part of the Nielsen family. So they got their own special box with it. And, you know, when they gave them that, then suddenly what they watch kind of dictates how ratings will go uh, on TV. So there are some local personalities like Tom Tucker from Family Guy who talks to Peter about it and says, hey, what kinds of things can I do to get you to watch? And Peter chips in certain things and he kind of gets that idea to grow what he and then he decides to say hey i'm gonna steal a bunch of nielsen boxes and really influence what happens with tv if i take a whole bunch of nielsen boxes here that i'm in complete control of anything that happens on tv i can make anyone do anything on a national scale obviously a nice facetious thing when it comes to family guy i love it it's one of those things that just says hey if i can do this i can control a larger demographic for that that's a Family Guy example, not with proportions, but just the Nielsen rating thing. They have ultimate power. It's a small sample size, less than 0 .03, or 0.03%. That's controlling everything else. Good Lord. I don't know any Nielsen family households. You might. Um, but what you watch, unfortunately, doesn't change a thing. It's what they watch, which is unfortunate. Um, another example here. Um, this one came up several years ago. Um, this is one, and I'll kind of just let it play out. I edited it down to a minute. You can listen to a proportion idea, and, and you, you should be able to get this answer, really. It doesn't, it has to do with driving, and even if you're not driving, I think you can get this one just fine. So, just take a listen to this one here. It's pretty funny. A guy's talking to his girlfriend uh, while they're doing a road trip, and he's asking her a uh, proportion-esque based question. So, take a listen to this one. If you are traveling 80 miles per hour, how long does it take you to go 80 miles? Okay, what do you think, Chell? If I run a mile in like nine minutes, I mean, but that's when I'm out of shape. When I'm really in shape, in like <laughs> seven minutes is when I'm like really in shape. Think about 80 miles per hour. <laughs> I would whack 80 in half, and that's 40. I mean, some cars' tires turn faster than others, but I think it also matters if your car's a stick automatic if I say I'm driving 80 miles per hour that means I'm going to go 80 miles in an hour no you are not I'm trying to explain the answer but well you are not making sense because <laughs> I make sense you do not make sense the answer to you don't know the answer I do know the you answer you can guess to me just like I guess to me <laughs> I guess to me I'm using math the answer is one hour okay so clearly a measure of overthinking it uh, on that end. Uh, 80 miles per hour, so per one hour is really what that means. And we won't do a miles per hour word problem, but 80 miles in one hour. So you didn't really have to extrapolate much with that proportion, but it is still a proportion-based problem. So anyway, let's just, let's let's go ahead and let's get to some of the proportion problems here. I'm gonna go ahead and move along with this one. Uh, well, actually prior to that, there's, there's one more thing I wanna do. Uh, this is an English-based thing. You might've done these a long time ago, but this will help get into the idea of what we can do in a math-based notion. And, and I'll literally write fractions going to this thing. Okay, let's take a look at this. A baby is to a pebble as a man is to a blank. So, a baby's not a pebble, 
but they are comparing something within them that maybe you can make sense of and see that tie-in. If a baby is in reference to a pebble in some sort of way, if there's a tie-in with that, then what would a man be equivalent to in this other sense? Is it a river? Is it a boulder? Is it a jar of almonds? Is it Richard Nixon? And there might be things that you can think about for all of these and make sense of them. You can skip pebbles on a river and a boulder is a bigger version of a pebble. Jar of almonds, I don't really know what I can say about that. And Richard Nixon is a man. Maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe there's a baby pebble, whatever, whatever. So what's the talk with this one here? Well, the answer has to do with how we're quantifying these things as they are. So a baby is a form of a human. But more importantly, it's a small human or a young human or whatever. But in this case, we'll just go ahead and say a small human. Now, a small human is tying in a way to a small version of a rock. That's what a pebble is in this case. It is a small rock. And I'm writing this as a fraction in that they are comparing in a way as a ratio of two quantitative, qualitative type value things. Now, I can write a proportion to this and tie in man in the same way. And the, and the order that it's written is super important in terms of what's called correspondence. Baby was written first, and then pebble was written second. Now, in this next ratio that we do, man is written first. So man associates with baby because they're both written first in their own respective ratios. So when I set up the equivalence of a proportion in A over B equals C over D, man is an idea of a big human. So what we need in our answer here that we're looking for is something that's going to correspond with the idea if this is human, human, this will be rock, rock. If this was small, small, this will be big, big. We're looking for an example of a big rock. You probably answered that long before I did. So the answer here is boulder. Even though Richard Nixon's a man, even though you skip pebbles on a river, we're looking for the idea of small human, small rock, big human, big rock. Okay? And that's the tie-in with proportions, and that's the idea. And there's a correspondence to it. You don't even have to say it this way. It doesn't have to be baby to pebble and man to rock. It can be baby to man and then pebble to rock. As long as you go the same way for both of them, and this, and this is key, this is important, especially for the word problems. As long as you go the same way when it comes to correspondence and those things have qualifying identities that can tie in with each other in some form, just like the inches on the map and the miles on the road, as long as I do inches and miles again, whether it's bigger or smaller, that's fine. Miles an hour, miles an hour, okay? So you can do those comparisons and compare baby to rock, uh, uh, baby to pebble, man to boulder, or baby to man and pebble to boulder. As long as those tie-ins work, you can reverse it. As long as those tie-ins work, that's setting up a proportion correctly. Now that's an idea of setting up a proportion, and we'll get back to that when we do the uh, big one later. All right, so let's take a look at an idea of a proportion and what we can do with it and rewrite them and kind of make sense of what the whole least common multiple idea is. If I want to get rid of a fraction, I'm going to use what's called the multiplication property of equality. And you know what it is because you've been doing it before. We just haven't really been saying the phrase much. The multiplication property of equality states whatever I do to one side by multiplication, I do to the other. It's a balance thing. You know it is that balance multiply both sides by something. So if I'm going to do that here, so let's say that I do not want B to be divided by in this equation. Well, what I'm going to choose to do then is I want to multiply both sides by B. I'm going to exercise the multiplication property of equality to make that happen. Now, in doing so, B divided by B on this side is 1. You might call it canceling out. You know why I don't like to say that term. But over here, B gets to multiply with C. Remember, it multiplies on top, not on bottom. But there is still a D down here that's dividing by that B times C. And let's say I want to have that D not be there anymore either. I want to not have any fractions, and I want to get rid of them. On the next step, or on this same step, if I just want to write it this way, I could also, likewise, multiply both sides by D. And if I multiply both sides by D, what happens on the right side is this D divides by this D, and they become one as well. And what you have here in this case are no more fractions. 
There are no more fractions in this thing. All that's left here, and I'm going to rewrite it in kind of an alphabetical form. D times A or A times D or AD equals C times B or B times C or BC. This is another way of writing what we have up there, but without fractions. We have busted those fractions by finding the equivalent of um, this isn't always the least common multiple, by the way. Maybe that's a poor target word to use, but it is a common multiple. If I multiply both sides by B and both sides by D, by both denominators, I've essentially gotten rid of those denominators. Okay. Um, there are other examples that I could use for whatever things. I'll just jump into the math examples when we do. But this is a way that you can ideally get rid of your fractions in your problem so you can sort things out much cleaner for yourself. It helps you make sense of them in a way so you don't have, you know, the fractions cause confusion, and especially when the variable's in the denominator, you want to get rid of that sucker and just put it on top somewhere. If you want to solve for x, you got to isolate it in the numerator. That's an important key. Now, there's another way of doing this. It's, it's the same thing, but there's another way of looking at it, and it's what's called cross-multiplication. Now, here's, if we look back at this thing again, if you look at what happened, if I get rid of what I wrote up here, and I ask you, ideally, what, what does it look like happened going from this step here into this step here? What it kind of looks like is the B kind of just moved away from the denominator and it came up here and multiplied with C. And the D kind of moved its way from the denominator right here and moved up here and multiplied with A. And what you see with those two arrows forms a cross. And what we did was we did multiplication up here. That's why they use the phrase, cross multiplication. So the B moves up here and multiplies, the D moves up here and multiplies, and they go across each other to do the multiplication. That's what it's called. Now, do we literally just move them up there to do that? No, we're multiplying both sides by those values. So if you understand what cross multiplication is and you don't confuse it for another instance, then you'll be good to go. For example, if you have two thirds times one sixth, you do not cross multiply like this. That makes no sense whatsoever. There's a lot wrong with what's being said there. Cross multiplication occurs with proportions. Furthermore, you can also not do it here. Let's say you have, um, let's see, I need to make sure this works out. Let's say you have something like uh, 2x plus 2 thirds equals 4 ninths. You can't just cross multiply these two things right here because the 2x is missing a multiple of 9 and a multiple of 3 that you got to make sure you know what you're doing with cross multiplication. So I, I am weary of using the phrase in fear of you using it incorrectly. But as long as you have a proportion, a fraction on one side and a fraction on the other side, move up the quantity from the denominator across to the other side, multiply them through, and you'll be set. So I'll be using the idea of cross multiplication for this thing when it comes to uh, f uh, fruition. But furthermore, I want to show you other ideas of what you can do in case cross multiplication isn't your preferred method. It's up to you and we'll see if I run into this. You know, this isn't the only way that you can write this proportion. This proportion comes from taking this and dividing both sides by D and dividing both sides by B. What if I wanted to divide both sides by A and divide both sides by C? Uh, by A on this side and by C on this side. So that, excuse me, the A's divide here, the C's divide here. Now I have something that says D over C equals B over A. Suddenly, A and B are on the right side and they're flipped. D and C are on the left side and they're flipped. There are a lot of ways you can write these proportions that correspond, just like the baby man pebble boulder thing. Baby can go to man as long as pebble goes to boulder, or man can go to, or excuse me, boulder can go to man as long as pebble goes to baby. It depends on the directions that you go. And that's the idea there. But the main focus here is going to be the, I guess, cross multiplication and solving. So let's get to it. Let's literally do some math examples right now. Jump into these, solve each proportion. All right. Solve each proportion. Now, when it comes down to it as well, if you have enough information to figure out what's going on here, let me give you another way of seeing these. Four kind of grows into eight. If you thought about the thing we talked about before, like four inches to eight inches, three feet to how many feet? Four grows into eight in that you're multiplying by two. So if I multiply three by two and I get six, that actually works as the answer. See, eight, six reduces to four thirds. There are ways you can do some of these like that if you really see it. But some answers aren't as obvious. And obviously, this I, I won't give you a bunch of integer answers only. So make sure you still know how to work the proportion idea 
let's multiply both sides by the other thing. I won't do cross multiplication on this one. I want to get you to understand. We can multiply both sides by 3. And we can multiply both sides by x. And what happens is the 3s go away here. The x's go away here. And what happens is 4 is going to multiply with x. And 8 is going to multiply with 3. That's what we're doing when we're solving the proportion. This is something you now know how to set up and solve. Or that's set up that you know how to solve. Divide both sides by 4. We get x equals 6. And that was the answer that we saw before, obviously. Okay, number two, I'll go ahead and do a cross multiplication method to kind of get you the idea behind what's uh, going on there. So again, two fractions set equal to each other. Let's go, let's cross multiply. Multiply the five with X and the three with seven. That's what's happening. So seven times three equals five times X. Boom, cross multiplication. I feel like a uh, Hulk in Endgame. Time travel! So, um, okay, spoilers. Uh, okay, 7 times 3 is 21, 5 times x is 5x, 5 times a number is 21, what is that number? If you don't know, divide both sides by 5 and that's how we get that. So not all of them can be done by trial and error if you're not totally, totally sure. 21 over 5 is a good, correct answer for me. Uh, an exact answer that also works, I think it's 4.2. So if you want to try and double check that, here's what you can do. Little will you substitute back in. But 7 divided by 5, figure out what that is. You get, I think it's 1.4. And then you try 4.2 divided by 3. See that you get 1.4 on both of them. And if you do, then it checks out. They're both in proportion because they both have equal ratios. That's what a proportion is. A comparison of two equal, uh, an equal comparison of two ratios that aren't even represented the same. Unless it's the 80 miles per hour, 80 miles in one hour thing. All right, two more problems to do. Let's go ahead and uh, attack these. Um, cross multiplication, but here's one where you gotta be a little bit more careful because six multiplies with this entire quantity. Now you're gonna see what that looks like in a bit. And nine times five goes over here. Okay, nine times five is 45. Now on this other side here, six doesn't just multiply with seven N. Remember six multiplies with the quantity, seven N plus nine. I have to use parentheses to indicate that 7n plus 9 is a grouping before 6. So 6 doesn't just multiply with one of them. It multiplies with both. And we learn distribution. So I can distribute the 6 into both of these right here. And then we go to town solving it thereafter. 45 equals 6 times 7n is 42n. 6 times 9 is 54. Okay. Now we solve the rest of the way as we would any other form. Subtract 54 from both sides. 45 minus 54 is negative 9. So negative 9 equals 42n. Divide both sides by 42. You'll get n equals negative 9 over 42. I think this actually can reduce. I can divide both these by 3. So let me clean that up a little bit more. n equals negative 3 over 14. Negative 3 fourteenths. Okay, so there's the answer to that one as we're working through. Uh, a fraction again, very strange one. You can double check by substituting and then you see that uh, it works if you did the math right. But cross multiplication, I, I don't want to say it, but I think I have to. Cross multiplication was the starting part. Distribution was involved and solving a two-step equation there on out with reducing a fraction. Uh, we haven't done fraction reduction yet, but if both things can divide by the same number, that's kind of working through a proportion kind of in a different way. And the last one, same thing. Um, we have uh, something on the bottom this time that's a quantity. And both of these, keep in mind, have to come up and multiply with the 8 over here as 2 multiplies with 4. Okay, so 2 times 4 is 8. And 8 over here is going to multiply with m minus 8. And of course, I'll distribute. 8 times m is 8m. And 8 times negative 8 is negative 64 and we solve. Subtract, or uh, excuse me, add 64 to both sides, we get 8m equals 72, and divide both sides by 8, you get m equals 9. Okay, so those are the ideas of proportions kind of in a nutshell. Yeah, it's cross multiply, but it's by finding a least common, not always least common multiple, you can, but it's uh, least common multiple would work for that. Let me, um, let me tackle, do I want to do this? I'll refrain. It's going to get a little too big. I was going to do this with a least common multiple. I won't. 
Uh, anyway, but that's the idea of the proportion solving them straight up. Now, I want to go back to the highlight problem one more time. We'll solve that one. We'll use the idea of proportions to set up one to solve, even though you might have a version of the answer on your own. So let's look at the highlight problem here again. We have a 90 foot totem pole with a 45 foot shadow and a six foot man with an unknown shadow length. That's the one we're trying to find. Now, before we solve this thing, keep in mind the pebble, uh, the baby pebble man boulder scenario. They have to have tie-ins that correspond to one each other for this to work. If I did baby is to a pebble as an alligator is to something, I don't really see the tie-in unless you can find the association with baby and alligator that you can to make pebble turn into what your next thing is. So baby and man, they're both humans and one's small human, one's big human. That's why that thing was okay to work with this. When we look at the totem pole and man thing, a totem pole is not a man, but that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we are looking at two, let me get back to this. We're looking at two items that stand vertically upright and cast a shadow at the same time. And that's important that we say uh, that this problem says at the same time. You know, the sun is at some position. And if these things are ideally next to each other, the sun is hitting these things at like the same angle. So if you have like a flagpole that's standing straight up right, right here, and the sun's hitting it at some angle, that angle is what is what creates the shadow. So as long as a man and a totem pole are kind of standing in the same spot and the sun is but gazillion you know, miles away or whatever it is, then it's going to be giving the same angle for our shadows, which creates what's called triangle similarity, something you're gonna do in, in the geometry aspect, but which creates this proportion, this idea that the man's not gonna have the same shadow length as the totem pole, it's gonna have a smaller one because the man is smaller in height. Now, how many times smaller is the man in height? That's a ratio that we can set up. Or, or we can say, how does the totem pole's height compare to its shadow? So we have two different options that we can do here. We can set up a ratio involving totem pole. Sorry, I'm not gonna do totem pole. I'm gonna say height of object, height to shadow length with height to shadow length. And by this, I'm referring to uh, this is for the pole, and this is for the man. The pole's height and shadow length, the man's height and shadow length. If they work in that correspondence, like again, height to shadow length, height to shadow length, in that direction, you can set up a proportion like that. You could also do another one if, um, kind of ran out of color suddenly. You can also do another one where I said it before, you can do the height of the pole to the height of the man. And the shadow of the pole to the shadow of the man. So we can do, um, let's see how I wanna say this. We can do pole to man and do pole to man, or you can do man to pole. You can do either way as long as you do both directions. And this one is height and this one is shadow length. So as long as things correspond, you can set up a proper proportion that way. Um, I'm gonna do the height and shadow one because I think the number is a lot easier for us to look at. Uh, then I'll probably do the other one, and then and that'll be it. That's going to be it. Um, so, okay. The height of the pole, of the totem pole, is 90 feet. We're comparing 90 feet of the height of the totem pole to the 45-foot shadow length. This is going to be equivalent to a ratio setup because of the sun and the way that they're standing upright. Those are all important. The man's height is 6 feet tall to this unknown shadow length right here. Now you might have some representation in making sense how this works, especially if you wanted to do a division. For, for example, 90 divided by 45 is two. So if this is two, we need to do six divided by some number to also give us two. Um, you probably know what that is. If you had a problem like this though, more, more people are comfortable using a proportion like this, writing it as a fraction, so they can cross multiply. That gets a little, um, I get a little on edge with that. I understand perception is key, but you do want to have multiple ways of knowing how to solve a problem regardless of what there is. But what I just did here was kind of important. I just reduced a fraction and that helps us with cross multiplication or however I want to call it. Why should I multiply 45 with six and X with 90 if I can multiply one with six and X with two? I reduced 40 over five to two over one. Yet another thing that's proportionally equivalent to this ratio. If 90 over 45 is two and two over one is two, 
they are in proportion. Six over what? Also give you an equivalent, just for the sake of it. Let's cross multiply. We got two times x equals six times one, or six. And then divide by two, we get x equals three. Now the answer is three feet. The shadow length for the man is gonna be three feet long if the man is six feet tall standing upright. Oh, you can't see that, hang on, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in your way. I was writing this right here, I'm sorry. There you go. That would be that final result there in setting that up. I could have set it up again using 90 and six. 90 divided by six equals 45 divided by x. You have a lot of different options in how you can set up that proportion as long as they fall in correspondence with each other. So anyway, so that's the idea behind proportions and how those things work. That's just in a nutshell. I gave you some little fun examples to begin with. Hopefully some of that stuff's making sense. Um, that's my whole conclusion with that. Just making sure that you go back to that success criteria. We take a look and say, did we accomplish what it is we wanted to? And did we find a way of doing it? So let's go back and look at that. Can we solve an algebraic proportion now? Probably, okay. How are you gonna do that? By eliminating the fractions from both sides by using, again, multiplication property of equality. Cross multiplication is multiplying both sides by both denominators, so the denominators cancel and go away. And that helps us solve it. And we did the highlight problem, and I'll taken care of. All right, that'll do it for this video. I sure hope that you learned a lot with this one. My name's Mr. Robinson, and peace out.